Thanks for having us out today. Uh, Mr. Blackbird here is on my crew, and uh, he's my head of ignitions, and we'll be doing the, the fire tomorrow. Um, I'd like to start out and just, uh, if you have questions, stop us as we go, and we can handle them just like we would uh, anything that would happen on a fire. Uh, my philosophy on prescribed fire is that you you take the, all of the rainfall that you're given and convert it to grass instead of transferring that to, to, to a meat product, we put it into brush control. And so you take what you can get for rainfall and we like that fire. Um, a lot of people look for the perfect set of uh, conditions and they'll postpone fires. And it's a, it's a dangerous game to get into because a fire is part of a process and, and there is no tool that, uh, that provides an instant solution. No chemical, no mechanical, uh, but, but fire is a great way to start and it is um, a natural choice for dealing with uh, land and range issues. Um, the, uh, for example, we have a, a client at Goldthwaite, and we, we set them up for a fire, it's going to be 600 acres, and he's really concerned about getting the cedar kill. And, uh, we, we got a little bit of rain, and he was afraid of green, and, and he started taking uh, cedar leaf moisture levels. And I think we burned 25,000 acres during the winter, and he sat on the sideline. And then he redid his fire guards, and he wanted to be a summer burn. And uh, uh, I guess we started the summer burn, and we burned maybe 14 or 15,000 acres, and he's still on the sideline waiting for the perfect condition, and we burned you know, another, I said, another 25,000 acres in the winter, and we probably burned 4,000 acres so far this June, and he still thinks it may be too wet for his fire. And so he could be on his third fire and really moved his project along. Um, oh, we pass this back and forth. And yes, any of you guys want to say a quick uh, word about equipment, uh, how prepared you should be? Ms. Blackford, you want to talk about your buggy and how equipped that is? I don't think you wanted to do this. <laughs> well, yes, no, we definitely uh, realize that the equipment is the most, or one of the most, besides the men and women that are part of it, the most important part of the the, old, the strategy Brian handles with the burn plan and the, the overlay of the, the day, the plan. Um, but we use all sorts of different equipment. We use uh, Flares rangers and uh, slide in sprayers. We use uh, leaf blowers for suppression, also, which is um, surprisingly effective. You would think that it would it would drive the fire, but it actually snuffs it out really quickly. So that's something good to keep in the back of your pickup just in case you see a fire on the side of the road. Leaf blower is very handy. Um, we uh, we use boilers for. For rougher country and real thick brush that the rangers can't get through, of course, pickups. Um, <coughs> we, let's see, here's a list of our equipment. Yes. We, we roll out with uh, two trucks that have 250 gallon slip in spray units, and we park one where we start, and the other one travels as support the whole time. We use at least two UTVs, two rangers, those run with 60 gallons, and we have two four wheels with 15 gallons. Uh, for Blackbird and I, as conservation fire team, we roll every fire with six to eight people, and that's if we're burning, you know, a hundred acres to two or three thousand acres. I think around three thousand as much as we burn in a day generally. Um, uh, we park the one rig in the in the weakest corner so that anybody could get back there and get to it. Uh, it's already on location. Uh, we always plan for the worst case on it. Like uh, Blackbird said, we use leaf blowers. Every every vehicle has a leaf blower strapped to it somewhere. Um, we will use a leaf blower, and we will not use any water uh, most of the time. And, uh, Blackbird and I also respond to uh, wildfires of a certain scale. And uh, on the well, three or four years ago, the head of the river fire, we put out maybe six to seven miles of open fire, 
and we used 60 gallons of water. Uh, we lit it, we did a lot of backlighting on it, and uh, uh, our, our entire site held, and they had spent a couple more days on the rest of the place conventionally putting water on it. Um, fire is really our only choice for fighting fire in most situations. We don't have the water resource to uh, uh, have the luxury of, of dropping tanker after tanker. Um, of course, we wear fireproof clothing. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've improved, we use an auxiliary fuel tank in one of the trucks, and we have our burn mix in, and it, it makes it a rapid refill. Um, and we have recently started using snake leggings, but not because we're afraid of snakes, but because it helps with the cactus needles and all the spines um, that you walk through. Uh, and I know that Mr. Russell uses different gear on the federal level and you know on, on a scale that we don't compete with, but uh, if you have anything to add on fire equipment, Randy? Yes, you can yes, sir, I can switch with it. Okay. Yes, I was going to talk later, but I'm up here now, just right in the middle of it, so we'll just uh, let her buck, I guess. Uh, yeah, I was a Fed uh, for 37 years. Earlier, Morgan mentioned PPE, and that stands for Personal Protective Equipment. Um, I guess a couple years ago, I met this team and, and I've actually burned with them, I don't know, seven locations. I don't know what the acres was, some of them was big, anywhere from a pivot to just some rangeland uh, settings. Uh, from safety, that was probably one reason that Brian wanted me to help him a little bit. We don't necessarily have fireproof clothing, we wear fire resistant clothing. It's Nomax, it's a cotton fabric that's treated and, and uh, it won't just flame up, but it just it, it resists fire. Uh, pants, and shirts, leather gloves. Uh, in National Forest Service, we it's mandatory to wear hard hats. Uh, down here, uh, I don't wear a hard hat because you're really not in fear of falling objects, you know, timber branches or, or snag accidents. Um, two years ago, there was a gal got killed from a falling snag, which is a dead tree, and she was about five tree lengths or more away from a falling operation. She was eating lunch in the safe position, location, and the fallers were down in a repairing area on, uh, there were some 90-foot cedar trees, which is relatively big compared to the ones you have down here, but it's uh, a cedar tree that grew in North Idaho. Well, the faller knocked down that cedar tree, and then it, it fell on a leaner tree, a tree that was just lean, and then that one, anyway, the chain of events, the fifth tree fell on this girl that was eating lunch. It was a fatality. Uh, kind of sad, so that's one reason for the hard hats. Uh, another safety item, I guess, would be that I kind of learned through the years is uh, don't wear any nylon. Nylon socks, and particularly, I guess this is kind of new age, or a lot of saddles are being equipped with nylon webbing and backpacks and day gear. Uh, don't wear nylon anywhere. Because if you ever get in a heated situation and, uh, and that nylon, uh, nylon just melts in your skin, and uh, you're much better off wearing cotton fabrics. So it's kind of a little thing, but it may mean something sometime. Is that about Yeah, true? I think that's good. Uh, so you have your equipment, and uh, you need to be sure it's in good working order. Uh, if, you know, before we light, we fire everything up. It's, it's, it, it may be too obvious to try, but once the genie's out of the bottle and you've got no equipment, uh, it's hard to look professional. Um, the, uh, uh, for us, fire safety, good fire safety is developed uh, before the fire is lit. Um, one thing, uh, the realtor's mantra, the location, 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 uh, you need to know your location the crew's location on the fire, location of water, location of different hazards, the locations of your smoke, the location the fire may go if it breaks out. Um, the next biggest thing to us is communication. You gotta know where you are and you gotta know how to communicate that. 
um, before every fire, and I, there's a lot of this is repeats, but and I may repeat myself during this. These are important things, but you always notify the sheriff. Uh, I, I write a letter to a county judge every time we light a fire. Uh, burn ban or not, because I think at our level, communication is key and it's one of the most important factors in fire safety. Uh, too many times we'll be filling up a drip torch or stop, pause on the side of a, a fire guard, and here comes a truck at like 75 miles an hour, skids to a stop, door swings open, guy steps out, and I'll stand up and say, hey, looks like nobody called you. Uh, they just come to create too much panic. And so communication to the neighbors, anybody that's going to be impacted by your smoke, uh, these are all important things that we have to figure in every time. Um, communication is important because so many people are going to see your smoke. And, you know, uh, for us, my crew, we like to do what we do because... At one, every day we know that we go to work, we know we make a difference. The second thing is, every day we go to work, we're going to upset some people. And generally, it's just the 911 operators, but uh, they get a lot of calls about the smoke. And if you, every time you like, if you will call dispatch, whatever the dispatch authority is, and get them to take your, your name, the address, and phone number, you are gold. You're, you're protected. Anything that happens after that. Um, some locations that we burn, like near Houston and Harris County, have their own set of communication issues. You heard a lot of talk about EPA and TCEQ. Now, if you can imagine calling the TCEQ in Harris County to tell them that you are about to light a fire at so and so ranch, and so and so ranch is not a development of houses, and then if you have to be able to communicate that issue, but then a lot of times maybe you have to move Farsi or some other foreign language to speak to the people that work in these offices. Uh, it makes it very difficult. Uh, but back on the fire, when everything is good, I want to know who is calling on the radio, their closest location, and what they see about fire behavior. Uh, so if, this is Blackbird, I'm at Charlie. Fire's looking good. It's back in. We've got so many yards of fire. Um, we're passing information. And all these communications have to do with location and, and the message. Um, you have to communicate to the crew. Uh, you have to watch them. Like tomorrow, our torch leaders, one of the things they're going to be looking for is, how's everybody doing? I mean, we just you walk two-tenths of a mile. It's not like walking to the mailbox because it's 1,000 degrees right here in your hip pocket. And it takes a lot of energy out of you. Um, we need to make sure everybody's drinking water. We need to have lots of communication, and communication makes a good burn day. Uh, a burn map is also how we communicate. Uh, the main reason to mark a map with uh, neutral locations is for clear communication. Um, I, I used to lease a lot of country for hunting, and, and you hear the legends of locations like the fig tree windmill. Well, I looked for two weeks for the fig tree windmill, and the fig tree died 30 years before, but it was still called the fig tree windmill. Or where we killed that rattlesnake two months ago, makes everybody pause to think instead of saying it's between Delta and Charlie. Uh, and we need a location. Um, the uh, burn plan is also a form of communication. Um, I use the Parks and Wildlife Private Lands burn plan format. Uh, you can download a bunch of them. Uh, there are different varieties, like Chris and some of the people have said, but uh, uh, that is uh, how you are going to communicate in court eventually that you gave this prior consideration if it gets to that point in our particular society, that, that you had adequate prior consideration given to the project because you were able to put it in writing and you did it before the fire started. Um, another thing, and this is something we'll cover at the briefing tomorrow, but uh, uh, when there is a problem, we call it a code yellow. Uh, we don't want anybody to panic. There's nothing to panic about. If you watch the fire, if you look at the fuels, if you dissect what you've seen, it may be that it gets into some little blue stem or silver blue stem that's 
pocket high and it's a raging fire. But just beyond it, it gets a little gravelly, a little sparse there, and you can walk up and just step it out. So there's never a reason to panic, but when we do have a situation where a fire gets out, we want to know and we want to attack it when it's the size of a paper plate. So we call it code yell. Early in our career, you know, we used to say important things like code red way back when it meant at the end of the burn and we'd run out of beer. But uh, <laughs> code yellow doesn't imply panic, but it does mean we need to get onto it. And we want to be able to attack these spots. We want a leaf blower there. We want to have water access. Uh, one of the great things about a leaf blower is it goes over a fence, a high fence, any kind of fence, very rapidly on somebody's back, and uh, we'll put a fire down. Um, but being aware, knowing your location, and being able to communicate are all parts of fire safety. And, uh, and being prepared, and that's where the fire equipment comes in. I don't know if you guys have anything to add on. Well, just go ahead. Thanks, Bert. Just some things on safety. It, it, some of the simplest little things will catch you when when Brian's team come in, comes in, we position all the vehicles, pre-position the vehicles, and we just don't pull in and park like we're in Walmart. We purposely pull in and back into position so if we need to get out in a hurry, we can come in and just leave that location and go to where we need it. We don't have to swirl around and get turned around. Uh, we leave the keys in every vehicle. Don't ever trip the keys from anything. Leave the keys in every rig. We uh, pick up. It's just kind of planning ahead. Question? Okay. Yeah, finish. No, I'm going to go ahead. Anytime. Well, on your mystery, you uh, now, on your blower, do you want to have the mister option on it, or just straight blower? No, we're just straight blower. We, we're, we're not big enough. Uh, but it's not, they make them now that go 255 miles an hour. Uh, I think our biggest one is 190 miles an hour. I mean, I, I mean our, our most fierce, it's not big, it's a handheld unit. But, you know, what it does is it doesn't just put the fire out, it backs the fire up. It flares it. It'll be in this bunch of grass, you put the blower on it, it absolutely turns red hot, and then, but it cannot advance. And so that, and then it also, in the duff and the leaves, especially under these live oaks and some shin oaks and stuff, it blows the leaves out. So you can actually put in a, a, a rake line, but you do it as fast as you can walk. How minute. much and where did, you, where did you get yours? How much more did it for the units? A leaf blower? They're uh, 150 bucks, uh, best techs, or you know, any. I mean, we use a commercial type product, uh, and most all of our equipment Echo or still. Uh, all of our spray units have a Honda motor on them. Um, we, we have a, a lot of expectation that they're going to run when we start uh, in the beginning of every day. Do you ever consider the backpack model? I use the backpack. I prefer it. Um, I've dropped a handheld over a high fence before, but the backpack went with me. And uh, uh, that's probably why you hadn't heard of us still today. Uh, we didn't make the 12 o'clock news. Uh, but the, any one of them, what you want is uh, something that is accessible and uh, not cumbersome, but puts out enough air, you know, I bet anything over 90 miles an hour would be good. Uh, Dr. Russell's got a battery powered one that's a pretty good cinch to start. I mean, just pull the trigger and it'll run for 40 minutes or so. Uh, it's a good tool to add. It's something we all have. And there's been a number of times when we, we, we drain our water, we load up, and we're leaving. And I bet three times at least on I-10 in Kimball County, we've stopped to put out fires with leaf blowers when they're waiting on the fire department to get there. Just walk out, blow it out, and go home. Um, so it, it, it's pretty handy, and it's a tool that we all should, should be practicing with. You know, we use them for a little bit. When they do, you, there's a technique to use them. You just don't go buy a leaf blower and go out and blow a tire around. You blow it back into itself. In other words, you blow the flame back into the light. And uh, the source flame length goes, I don't know, in your experience, how 
effective the blower is on, say, a two foot plane length? It, it really it wouldn't matter. And as long as it's not into the trees. When it gets into the cedar trees, the best thing to do is shut it off and wait till it burns the other side and then put the fire out. These are the points that you do not panic on. It's not going to, you're not, you know, if, if in 200 years or since Jake Landers cut that last shin oak tree, Edwards County did not burn, I don't think we can light the whole county that day either. So we just, just it's going to burn this tree. The energy is going to dissipate. When the fire comes down, we pick out all the places it's spreading and put it out. We have a plan and act that uh, a lot of times we'll carry four torches to start it out. And the plan is that the fourth torch walks the line. He, he brings it all up and hooks it off and stays with that fire while everybody else is going to the spot. Um, and, you know, it's, it's amazing how far, the, how far a fire will move when it wants to. Uh, but the... For fire safety, our, our number one thing that we do, and, and, the, and the reason we're so effective on wildfires even, is we start early. Uh, fire is a late sleeper. Um, she parties all night long and then sleeps in and then starts up again the next day. And uh, that, that's, that's the trick. I mean, we, uh, tomorrow morning, it's going to be 82, 85% humidity when we're going to start this fire. Uh, your textbook, and I have never seen one, but the textbook would say that that is not good conditions for burning, that you want to hit 30% humidity or something like that. Well, that first four lines that we carry across the pasture, even, even on a, a big burn, you know, if we get 50 feet wide, well, we, we burn 1% of that pasture below, below margin, what we're doing is we're selectively stealing the escape routes, and we're taking the fuel, taking that underbrush on the back side of the fire, and uh, making it where she can't go. Our ashes go over the road, go over the fire guard, that, that happens. If you did it at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, we'd all have heart attacks. But uh, first thing in the morning, they land and they go out, and it's a, it's a safe way to do it. I just want to add, uh, you know, the communication with the ignitions team, when you've got a guy walking with a torch and a guy behind him, a lot of those communications are not verbal. You know, I'll turn, we always stop, turn around, we watch the fire behavior. Dr. Morgan, uh, she she us a lot about that. You know, <coughs> you can't take your eye off the ball for a second. You got to stop, turn around, and see what it's doing, and also communicate. If you see a wind change or a gust come in, we stop and report that, hey, this is lead torch. I got a gust out of the west, just a heads up. And my guy behind me knows that, and then everybody else down the line knows that. But constant uh, kind of updates to, to what's going on on the ground, uh, that, that you can't really have too much of that. Yes. Yeah, question. Uh, I was curious on your, your personal management. Uh, all my experience has been wildfire, and it's all hand everybody you can get to fight fire, and there's just stop it where you want to stop it. I have, and, I, and I'm sure we're going to get some context tomorrow, but we're going to have a tremendous amount of people from what I understand. How many, is there a number of people you have per acreage, or? Um, no, and, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that more, about burning with less and I think that's the direction our fire culture needs to move. Uh, uh, I, there's no disrespect in different approaches to handling fire, dealing with fire, or even dealing with wildfire. But, you know, the bottom line is, is that most times that government position has to have its truck turned off and in the parking lot by a certain so many hours in a day. And uh, when we go, when we get invited, the rancher will call us and say, the fire's on, the fire's coming. You know, we'll go, we'll assess it, we may work on it, we may get a couple hours uh, shut-eye, and then go out at four in the morning with leaf blowers and mop the whole thing up. I mean, it's just, it's just a small fire. And what happens is, is there's this, this cycle with the with the organized wildfire fighting is they have a briefing in the morning, everybody gets organized and goes back out, and 
and then she's up and at it again. She's partying hard, and uh, you know that's more than more than we can handle. We don't have enough water resources to fight a fire. I think most of our problems occur, in my opinion, when we go and heroically go down into a gully, lose two tires on our army truck, put the fire out, go home, and it's back the next day. And and I think that when you look at prescribed fire, you also need to look at the other side of the picture as wildfire and decide my fire guards, the, the same way that we build a fire, we put a fire out. And, uh, you know, knowing your assets and things that on your property that would make a difference during prescribed fire are the same things that would make a good line and a good difference during a wildfire. But for us, when we use uh, six, six to eight guys, most of the time on all burns, but there's things that I could get away with on my ranch or you could get away with on your ranch uh, as long as, as individuals. But uh, when you bring somebody in as a professional status, commercial burn managers, expectation on us that we're going to come with whatever a jury is going to call adequate proof and adequate proof. Yes, sir. When y'all when y'all a lot of fire with the higher humidity or early in the morning, do y'all have much trouble with dirty burns or does it burn pretty good? I mean, I know the textbook y'all are talking about. It's like the government a lot of times if they're doing it, it's going to be nine thirty, ten o'clock with a certain humidity. But I was wondering if, if y'all are burning with a higher humidity, do y'all have that problem or does it burn pretty good? It, it all burns. I mean, by the end of the day, you're really not going to tell the difference. Um, I think there are situations, though, where you could burn something at 70 or 80 percent humidity, and then you could get a massive change in condition, and the fire could come back through at like 9 percent humidity and find new things to burn. Uh, we leave a lot more crown on the grass. It recover quicker, but uh, it's a uh, fuel. I think fuel and wind. Maybe temperature are, are, are together are three legged stool that, that probably has more impact than humidity on the fire. Uh, we, we select in our, in our firing techniques, uh, let's say your goal is to save your live oaks, and, but you want to kill all your prickly pear and cedar. Well, that may not work together if, they're, if your live oaks have a lot of brush underneath them. The balance to that would be for us to say, okay, we're going to come in and burn you where our low is only maybe 60% humidity. And so we'll burn in the 80 to 60%. We'll, we'll take the grass. Prickly pear is one of the easiest things to kill. Um, uh, and uh, we'll get a percentage of your brush. But we'll clean it up to the point where, let's call that a layup shot to the green. And then we can get on the green and get, get, the, get the effect you want with the second burn. Um, so, you, so you basically burn out those areas, so then you come back at a, a, a condition where it burns hotter and go through there but not damage the tree. Right, like uh, uh, on the 4K, we had a burn uh, in McCullough County, and they're about here in the corner, uh, and uh, it was a, a marginal burn, not a lot of grass, very heavy prickly pear, um, uh, concern on trees, and we did that burn, and then we came back nine months later and burned at the end of the summer, and or beginning of summer from a fall fire, I guess is what it was, and uh, just knocked the snot out. But the edge was clean. I mean, there was, there was no worry, no way I had to stay up. We didn't use a chainsaw. It, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fire that you want to have, but it takes a step to get there. Yes? Excuse me. What uh, your videos look really bright, and I can tell there's a lot of wind. Sometimes. What uh, you know? I've had some you know marginal, you know, like six miles an hour and seventy degrees and thirty percent. You just fight and fight and fight and fight and get the burn, and then you get the conditions right, and it's bright. What what's your your what kind of what kind of conditions can you push as far as wind? Um, our number, no matter what your goal is, my number one goal is to be to have a safe fire. And so I'm going to have to make a decision that gets both of us as close as we can, but I'm going to win. 
uh, because we're going to have a safe fire. Uh, tomorrow, there's not going to be a lot of wind. Uh, it's going to be under 10 miles an hour. Um, and, and no matter what we say, no matter what the forecaster says, that's not what's going to happen most likely. Uh, so plan for that to begin with. But, you know, wind dies all the time, but if we have it wrong, then, then we go in and we burn out. We, we hunt fuel, we divide the property into quadrants or sections, everybody takes a piece and then we light from these UTVs and ATVs, and, and the fire will keep, as long as there's fuel, it's going to keep burning. And, you know, the wind helps us know the direction it's going to go. Um, you know, by law, I'm not supposed to burn under three or four miles an hour. It's maybe six even, I think. But uh, uh, the TCQ in this region just started paying attention to fire and actually writing down notes. So, you know, they haven't caught up to where other parts of the state are. Uh, but that's one thing we're trying to get the TCQ to remedy is... You know, are they trying to control air quality or people? And if we're trying to control air quality, then as professionals, we can take steps to remedy those situations. Um, the runaround answer for your question is, every day is a good burn day. Uh, the more, most important thing, instead of the magic bullet and solving all your brush problems with one fire, is to move the ball off the line of scrimmage. And every time, that, that's our recommendation every time. Even if the conditions aren't ideal, that's great. I mean, if we're talking a thousand acre pasture and we only get 70% of your brush and 80% of your prickly pear, you couldn't have treated it any other way more effectively, efficiently, and, and, and in the same cost ballpark. So every fire is a good fire, every fire moves it along. Um, I don't think you can make a bad decision on the fire unless you're obviously killing people. Well, where are you going? Is it 20 or 25 miles an hour? Oh, no, I, I stay home with them. If it blows my hat off, I'm done. Uh, there, there's no... Once you start, you can't really quit. You shouldn't. <laughs> uh, and, and another thing we learned early on is we don't leave for lunch. Once it gets you say, okay, it's, it's too windy, we're, we're going to leave. Well, I use the forecast for that. I count on it. If I use weather.gov. I do the tabular forecast. I put all the boxes that have to do with fire. And four days out, it's a pretty fair indication. If it's got a lot of movement on it with wind direction, wind speeds, anything like that, then, then I will call NOAA, and they are very good about answering your questions, um, and they'll even provide you with spot forecasts the day of your fire. Uh, once we start, I think only one time have we ever put the genie back in the bottle, and on the backfire, and this is where I know about climbing high fences with backpack blowers and stuff, is that it, any time the fuel dropped the ground, it shot right up the tree, laddered up, and then went over the fence. And all of a sudden, we had seven spots or something. And the next day is when all those wildfires started in 2011. We think we could have burned the Canadian River from Menard County that day, but uh, we echo leaf blowers. <laughs> Plug them. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so I'm part of the Tarleton Prescribed Burn Society, and we're just starting up. Uh, we have our basic tools. We have two drip torches and the basic hand tools, but we're wondering what our next big investment should be. Radio. You think radio? What would be after that? So you keep talking about leaf blowers. Would that be your next step if you were in our position? Yes, but I would, I mean, uh, a leaf blower is cheap compared to a good radio or, or any other equipment. I, I think I think you need to have mobile water. I mean, you, you can't. This and every time I go look set up a burn and talk to the people, what what I'm talking about, and I say this, I mean, when I look at Skipper's deal, what we're talking about is what this is going to look like in court when we're standing there together and you say, I hired him, and this is what happened. You know, so. We make those plans that the landowner installing the fire breaks, uh, that, that is the biggest step towards limiting his liability and negligence. Um, hiring a professional with insurance is the other, other step in it. Um, for, for, but to go to court and not have mobile water, 
I think it would be a, a hard position to be in. Uh, so, you know, a slip-in unit, um, uh, it doesn't have to have a Honda motor on it necessarily. It have uh, the same little three-horse uh, electric motors even, you know, and just a big plastic jug, but you, you want to be able to exhibit that you thought it through and you came with the tools for the forecast you were in. Now, you know, a lot of times we'll, we'll have somebody set up a fire and it'll get pushed back. And so instead of being a, a, a 15 or 20 foot fire guard that would have been okay in February, you know, we're going to need, we're going to need 30 feet and we're going to need the ball to brush push back. Uh, so you, your equipment needs to match the forecast. Your forecast needs to match your equipment. It's, it's a big picture thing, and we need to look at the big picture. The Indians had a great advantage over us because they like the fires and leave. <laughs> training. Training, sometimes training is pretty key. Get good people, help you. Learn association. And practice. We're very lucky to talk. Thank you. I'm going to have the spare tires. Jacks, ball jacks, scissor jacks, blood wrenches. You gotta have a lot of those. The plug kits, air compressors, the works. You can't ever have too much equipment in my mind. Tools, guys that know how to use them, guys who can change a flat tire in the, in the dark under duress helps. We have a guy that can lift a ranger up to put a tire on it if it's really needed. The lead blowers will put your tires on it. What's that? The leaf blowers will put your tires out. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that you need that sometimes. <laughs> uh, hose clamps. A few hose clamps are pretty good to have, too. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I, I, I kid about it a lot. Uh, I, I haven't seen the textbook, so I don't know what I can do. Uh, we've been very effective. Um, we burn 30 to 50,000 acres every year. Uh, we've been doing it since 2006. Uh, I, 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 like I said, I'm not a scientist, but I can say that when I go across the pasture that we burn, and, and you may see some of these pictures where the prickly pear is laid over flat and it's turning clear, and we haven't been done for an hour, or you know whatever it was, it's just a black melt sticking out of the ground. I don't know if I killed it or not, but I sure put it on the sidelines for this year, and that's our goal. And like Dr. Landers was saying, I, I, I truly believe in the places we burn frequently, they, they, they're grass savanna, and there is all of that brush in it. Before there was Dow or anybody else that knew how to kill stuff, it was all part of the prairie, and the, the fire return interval is what kept it shorter than the grass. And, and for us as land managers, instead of spending you know, what, $125 an acre to clear a pasture, clear a strip around it and burn the pasture and burn the pasture over time. And I think it's the best thing you can do is you can get the best results long term. It's a sustainable practice and uh, it's uh, uh, going to promote all things that are important to us in this room. Mr. Tate? Talking about relationships and relationships with the stuff that letter you write to the judge. Uh, having a good relationship with them, can you burn during a burn ban in the county? By license, I can and I do, but occasionally we meet up with a judge that uh, doesn't want us to, uh, and it's not worth it's not worth us proving to him that we can. Uh, even if there's four or five roads out of that county and he doesn't know which one we're going to take. Uh, we're going to leave a signal to him that we were disregarding his authority. Uh, I think that comes back to communication. We're in the right. We have a license. We have the ability to burn. Is it a wise choice? And and once you buck the judge, uh, what ha who do you ask for forgiveness when when something goes wrong? Uh, it, this is communication 101, and you need to balance it out. And know what your priorities are, and that should go with your, your goal. Don't get target fixated and I uh, spent the money on the fire guard, we're going to burn this week. Well, conditions change rapidly here, if you hadn't noticed, and uh, your fire guards, they could be good for three months. I mean, some of them, depending on how they were cleaned up, but it's always best to uh, uh, wait for a better day than to die on that hill, I think. 
Mr. Clark. Talk to us about fuel loads and how do you determine if there's enough fuel and, and they say so many thousand pounds per acre, but most of them don't have a judge there. So what do you look at? Um, well, and as we go around the unit, we, we try and talk about what it's going to look like after we burn it with this fuel load. And, and you know, when we start talking about 2,000 pounds of grass or something, you know, that's, that's a pretty contiguous standing grass knee high. And uh, if, if we have spots of that, what we're really looking for is a, is a contiguous turf is ideal. Otherwise, what I do is I explain how this is going to be left out. And I said, that's, that's nothing to be ashamed of because fire naturally creates a mosaic pattern. And I think if we're trying to recreate natural uh, methods, uh, that a mosaic pattern is, is, is better, your country will, will uh, begin to heal and, and repair faster. Um, when, when somebody is disappointed they did not get nuclear black and have white ash and smoking sticks, um, you know, that, that's the kind, it, it may be really good for brush control, but it's going to take a long time to recover. And, and I think the best plan is to take whatever, if you have a livestock operation, or whatever that is, and we balance that into fire. And the best way to do that is obviously with rotation. Um, and, and what I did, at, what we do it at our place is we, we short, if, if all my pastures are 500 acres now, I take one 500 acre pasture out. So I run uh, that many animal units short, but I always have a pasture ready to burn. And eventually I'll be able to do even more stock because I mean, when we talk about stocking rates and pastures, a lot of times we don't take into consideration what is usable ground, what can be eaten. You know, just because it's a thousand acre pasture, that means a thousand acres of feed. And so we could have 70% closure on brush or Prickly pear could be invaded so bad that you know you get two or three days grazing out of the pasture. I still think we should burn that pasture. I think we should burn it and burn around the edges wherever there is fuel, and then that will create more grass, which will be more fuel for the next fire. And then you get in the process because we have to do something to break the cycle that is, is driving us nearly out of business by the practices we have. Um, I think, though, as a whole, I, 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 I'm like a, a report card for a teacher. I can look at the pasture and say, this is going to be an A-plus burn, and we're going to just knock it down. Or this is going to be a B-minus, but B-minus is good. Uh, C-plus is good. In a lot of places we go, uh, you know, the, the, there could be continual grazing in the pasture, and, and they have created the fire guards. And we think cattle are too expensive to burn around, but, but some ranchers don't agree with us, and they do move out of the way for the most part. Um, but... Uh, the, the mentality, Skipper, needs to be that God gave me the rain, I grew that grass, I need brush control, not pounds of, of forage to, this year, convert it, convert it to brush control, and I mean, it's like shooting a buck when you sell a buck. You know, this is the, uh, the natural free range move and say that this is indicative of what this year's weather pattern produced, and so it's a trophy for this year. And so this burn could be a trophy burn for this year with what we could produce. But what we've done is we've turned the cycle around and started moving in that direction. Good question. Uh, do y'all have a strategy for uh, when, specifically, if you have like a standard brush and then we're going to burn everything out, but that standard brush is going to leave, it's going to burn hotter, so you're going to sterilize that soil underneath. You're going to have to sterilize that soil. Do y'all have a strategy to help that soil recover? Do y'all reseed it? What? No, we think that that's that we're doing. That's just the way that the cards were stacked, and and then we're going to reshuffle the deck through a series of fires or whatever, whatever tool that we're going to throw at it. You know, a lot of this may it's like playing blackjack. As long as you're consistent, you're going to come out a winner on it. And, and, you know, we have a lot of live oaks. We have a lot of brush. We probably don't need to save them all. This is not the way our country looked. Uh, it's what are your goals, what's important to you, you know, who's got your ear? Is it an extension or a realtor? Or, I mean, you know, what, what are your goals with it? But 
But I wouldn't be afraid of sterilizing ground because uh, God's got a plan for that. Um, if you're making brush files, I think more small brush files is better than Walmart sized brush files uh, because of that factor. But, uh, um, you know, where you make it that hot, I think there's going to be a lot of ash, and then you're going to get a lot of hoof action, at least from the wildlife, uh, through that spot, and, and it, it will work itself out. Uh, and then on, on nesting cover, because we, we do, we, we encourage burning all year long. Uh, you know, if you, if you enlist to what Dr. Lander said, he's implying that the Native Americans lit most of those fires. And in the late 60s to the early 1870s, fire diminished from the Edwards Plateau because there were so many of us that they left. And... Uh, that, that stopped the fires. And then it, it really got good in the 50s when the rural telephone was able to get the fire department all the way back to where the fire was. They even knew that there was a fire, so they started putting fires out. And uh, um, that's, uh, but if you burn, if you use fire to, predict, to promote diversity and you only burn during the same two months of the year, you're actually serving to limit your potential for diversity. And so you should burn at different times of year. But I think we all have recognized that on bad years that start out tough in the summer and then they get wet, that the quail nest throughout the summer and even into September, and you see bumblebees out there with them. And so, you know, don't be afraid of burning because of nesting cover. That animal is equipped through centuries to have another nest and another clutch, and it'll be in better condition, and you will move the ball forward in place. Okay. He's going to talk more, so we'll be able to ask him more questions. So let's give the three amigos a round.